Friends, believe it or not, it was 18 years ago that electrification became a big thing in cars. Since then, this whiz-bang technology from the 1800s has made its way to race cars, fancy cars, and even sorta normal cars. But now it's high time to look at the application of this technology in the family car, or whatever the family car has become. So right from the outset, a uh, bit of full disclosure. When you and I unpack things like this, baby buggies, small crossovers, Nissan Rogues, uh, we generally don't spend a lot of time talking about bullets and numbers of performance figures, because that's not what these things are about. But in this case, we have two propulsion systems, so we do need to unpack some figures. Uh, let's start with the internal combustion engine. 141 horsepower, which comes in at a relatively aggressive 6,000 RPM. And then there's the torque. 144 pound-feet of torque, which comes in at a relatively middle-of-the-road engine speed of 3,600 RPM. Now let's put that aside, the electric motor. That adds an additional 40 horsepower, but more important to us, 118 pound-feet of torque. Now I would love to tell you that the Nismo engineers played around with this thing, and you just add those figures together and get something like 262 pound-feet of torque in a Nissan Rogue, which would be great, people. Um, but sadly, that is not going to happen. Uh, so really, the total system horsepower is optimized for efficiency at 176 total system horsepower. Now, how does it all translate out to the road? So as I've been driving this thing, I'm trying to remember the last time you and I drove a road together. And I think it's been like two and a half, three years. But this is a bit of a different experience because we're adding another propulsion system. And really the goal here isn't, is it fast or does it have a lot of pulling power or pushing power? I mean, it gets up and goes when I put my foot into it. I mean, is it an AMG? No, it's not trying to be. Um, but really what we need to understand is it feel more like the gasoline Rogue, which is like a normal car that you and I are used to, or does it feel like a blah hybrid that just is as exciting as celery to drive. And we've got a nice hill, so let's put our foot into it a bit. And the handoff from gas to electric, uh, I don't want to say it's seamless, but it's, it's very quick, and there isn't like a delay that you get in some uh, hybrids where you actually lose acceleration for the sake of efficiency. But now let's try this trick again, but this time on a bigger road but a longer, slower incline, and instead of putting our foot into it, let's keep the load even, see if it could switch back and forth between EV and gas to get some torque to go up the hill. And as we get to the crest of the hill here, it actually stays in gasoline mode, which is admirable. So at the end of the day, it's got plenty of power for the normal uses of the kind of person that would drive a vehicle like this. So not me, not a Lotus guy, but definitely easy to get around town or really this stunning beauty of Lake Oconee, Georgia. Being that hybrids have been around since about the late 90s, actually if I really want to be pedantic, they've been around for over 100 years, but what we need to focus on is what we're familiar with, which is recent automotive history, which is to say systems like the Toyota, an internal combustion engine, an electric motor or two, uh, a, a torque converter, and a CVT. This, this is a bit of a different mousetrap. What this is, uh, is an internal combustion engine, one electric motor, and two clutches, and yes, of course, the aforementioned CVT. Uh, and basically, we need to unpack how those clutches work. So clutch number one between the internal combustion engine and uh, the electric motor does exactly what it's supposed to do, which is to engage and disengage the internal combustion engine so the vehicle can run in full EV mode. Now, there are two interesting points about that. Uh, number one, uh, the engineers, they've provided certain programming in the mapping to separate out the torque. So it's 118 pound-feet of torque, but instead of having two motors and the cost of two electric motors, they've programmed one-third of that 118 pound-feet to be cranking power and two-thirds for full electric drive. And basically, it'll do two instances, up to 25 miles an hour or 
uh, actually end, or if I really want to be pedantic, uh, two minutes. Now let's put that aside, go into clutch number two, which separates the EV and the CVT, and this does the job of the torque converter, and really there are two things that they kind of dive off of that. Number one, it allows the vehicle to coast, thus improving overall efficiency, and number two, and this is simultaneous, it, it enables it to do regen, basically provide energy back in to the batteries. And this is also in concert with a regen braking system. So they take the hydraulic braking system, they throw it out, put an electric braking system in. So all of that provides energy back into the batteries. Now that's a lot of moving parts. Uh, so we need to unpack how that works in terms of driving dynamics out on the roads. So all of that is for 33, 35, 34 combined MPG. And just a hint vice there, those numbers are preliminary estimates. They're not yet blessed by the EPA. And generally, when you graft on a whole second propulsion system, it has a huge negative impact on driving dynamics. Like this turn up here, you would generally go off into those trees if you're pushing it even just a little bit. But I've spent the day driving this thing now and uh, I will admit, somewhat of an unexpected result. Let's like, put our foot into this thing, going up the hill. There's a bit of a turn coming up here. Please don't try this at home. And there's virtually no lean over there. Usually when you have that additional propulsion system and you get that raft of batteries, it raises the ride height of the vehicle. But if you remember, we talked about this in Miami, the battery sits underneath the back seat in the cargo area, so it actually is packaged very low. So even with these kind of roads, and I'm pushing it way too hard for what it should do here, and it, it, it doesn't embarrass itself, meaning I'm not gonna go off into that ditch and go off into those trees. But there is a catch. It's when you do the same thing, but then try to change the speed of the vehicle. Put the brakes out in the wrong place. And that's when it's like, hold on a minute there, Tex. We got a whole lot of weight there. We got a badonk dunk to deal with. Uh, and it's got to like move that weight somewhere around unexpectedly. And that's when you really feel you're driving a hybrid with two propulsion systems is when you introduce the braking. Other than that, it's actually surprisingly packaged and well balanced around roads that I wouldn't expect. So aside from having a thing for Southern Bells, I do like the pace of life down here in the South, uh, which brings up a rather important point. Um, small crossovers, they're not really meant to be luxurious. I kind of find that very strange. Uh, but the folks, uh, the engineers at Nissan, really wasn't the engineers, it was the product planners I was chatting with, they were telling me they make this very fancy model now uh, that's supposed to mimic what I am doing right now, which is, I guess, relaxation in a car really meant for a family, a young family, which by definition um, is craziness, right? Granted, I'm totally irresponsible, uh, don't have any children, at least none that I know of, so perhaps I'm not the authority on this, but that does seem a bit of an oxymoron to me. Anyway, uh, the other interesting point is that battery takes up part of that back area there. Um, but yeah, other than that, it's definitely a small crossover. Now, when you and I first discussed this in Miami, I posed the question, does one need fancy in a small family crossover? And you guys were kind of divided on that topic. But now here's a situation where we're literally, the rubber actually meets the road. And this one actually is not the fanciest one. This is the middle of the road model, but it's still much fancier than the one that came before it. Like for example, the leather is nicer. It's like they put the details in it like this. But the biggest thing you notice is the steering wheel. Uh, Nissan, if you haven't noticed over the past like, I don't know, five, six years, they all have the same steering wheels with the exception of a Z and at that it still shares some of the details with other Nissans. This is a whole new paradigm shift. And can I say thank you? Uh, the buttons are more mature, it's a prettier looking steering wheel, and it's actually a lot easier to use, which brings up the next point. There's a, a whole lot of like tech going on in here. Like this has got all the usual blind spot stuff and all the safety crap, uh, but it is missing some things. Like it doesn't have Apple CarPlay, doesn't have Android Auto. I would think, and I would at least hope, 
that Nissan would add this in the next year or so. A little bit behind the, the, the eight ball on this one because now the list of car companies that support both Android Auto as well as Apple CarPlay is longer than the ones that don't support it. So I would say get on it, especially if this is targeted towards young families that frankly grew up with smartphones and now have children that probably have their own smartphones, don't they? So in summary, what do we got? Well, something rather surprising. You see, when I stepped on the plane in California to come here to Georgia to drive this, I really did not expect to like the result of the surgery of grafting on an HEV to an existing ICE platform. And that's because it never works. I don't care if it's a crossover or a sedan, you're just adding too much weight, you're changing the center of gravity, and the only way to describe the driving dynamics is they suck. But in this case, it's actually a pleasant vehicle to drive. And there's a couple of reasons for that. We already talked about the battery placement in the tech review from Miami, but there's also the two clutches and the fact that there's only one electric motor. And what that translates to is the weight penalty in going from ICE to HEV is less than other similar mousetraps that do this. So what you get is a family vehicle that actually is good to drive and has some efficiency. Granted, uh, the electric braking system could use some help, but other than that, a pleasant thing to drive. Uh, but now we need to talk about a business case, and you know I never like to talk about money on the show, but in this case, we have to. Um, this is a five to eight MPG increase over the ICE counterpart. Uh, now, I went to all the Nissan people and asked them, what's the price going to be? And no one would tell me. They just said, it's going to be competitive. And what that means to you and I is it's going to be priced like a RAV4. So let's do like a small focus group case study. And what I want to know from you guys is this. What is that 5 to 8 MPG improvement worth it to you guys? Like how many dollars, euros, pounds, shekels would you pay to get 5 to 8 MPG improvement? And as like a yardstick, we already talked about this in other episodes, a Prius is 40,000 miles a year for four and a half years just to break even. And we don't even know what the delta is here. So what I want to know from you is how much, what region of the world you live, and for good measure, I want to know what you're doing with it on a daily basis. Let me know in the comments below or via our social media, Moto Man TV on Word, Moto Man TV on Word, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And with that, I want to leave you with two things. Uh, number one, make sure you download our fancy new mobile application. And normally I like to squeeze in the fact that we're on five airlines now. But number two, the fun fact, while we were shooting this, we got a tweet from a guy named Frank Leonard. I think he's based in the Bay Area. And he was flying down to Thermal, you know, the, the, the track outside of Palm Springs to drive an M2 on the thermal track, and he was watching my episode of the M2 on Virgin America. Now, if that's not a fun fact, I don't know what is. Frank, thank you very much for sending the tweet in, and you should be following me on Twitter, MotomanTV, all one word. Uh, and until I see you next time, probably not from a golf course in Georgia, bis später.